As you're turning to Revelation 13, something I'd like to underline in your minds as we do that is that what we're looking at is not at the Antichrist and not at the beast and not at the false prophet and not at the lies of hell and the venom coming out of the pit. What we're looking at is the genuineness of Jesus Christ. And if there's anything that I could underline in your mind, it would be how important it is to enter into a life long study of the Word of God as it teaches about the character of Jesus Christ. You've heard this many times, but I'd just like to remind you of it, that when the U.S. Department of Treasury trains those currency hounds that go out looking for counterfeit money, most often they never get to see counterfeit money. Because if someone gets used to seeing counterfeit money, then it'll look normal to them. But if all you look at is the real thing, then when you see something that is not real, that is uh, counterfeit or a fake currency, it will just jump out at you. And I think sometimes Christians, especially prophecy hounds, spend all their time studying about all the extraneous stuff of prophecy instead of looking at the genuineness of Christ so that the more the world gets departed from that, the more vivid it is to us because we're looking at the real thing. And my goal is, and, and I'll tell you up front, I found it's, more profitable to tell you instead of keeping it to the end. My goal is to get many of you, some of you at least, but many of you to start in the process as you're reading the Bible. And I told it to a little nine-year-old fellow that tells me where he is in his Bible reading. He wants to read through the whole Bible, and he just told me every week he wants to tell me, so he'll have to tell me the next week where he is. And I, I told him this week, and I share with you, that don't just read the Bible, and don't just study the Bible, but Spend time looking for Jesus Christ in the Bible and look at the genuine thing, Jesus Christ, and look for his names. So far in my life, I've found 406 different names of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this book, and I'm still looking. And, and I, every time I read, I look for another one of the precious names of Jesus Christ, God the Son, or of God the Father, of God the Holy Spirit. And I hope that uh, all this stuff that I'm going to share about the Antichrist and the beast, the false prophet, the dragon himself, Satan, will not be the main thing that we think about, but rather that we will focus on the real thing, the genuineness of Christ. Imagine what it would be like if a perfect leader were to step forward tomorrow morning. Add to that that this perfect leader appeared seemingly from nowhere. And he seemed to everyone to be almost someone from the past. One who rolls into one great personage all of the incredible leaders of the world from the past. Imagine someone that had the strength of one of the Caesars. They had the military genius of Alexander the Great. They had the mesmerizing oratory of Hitler. They had the warmth of Ronald Reagan. Had the ruthless determination of a Genghis Khan and had the apparent compassion and tenderness of Jesus Christ. Impossible? No. He's coming. He may well be walking around today. Because ever since the Garden of Eden, mankind has sought to be like God. And in this insatiable quest, man has come to the glorification of the creature over the Creator. The exaltation of man is called for men of strong persuasion who have been able to rise to extreme heights of power. And in history past, we have seen the rise of the Ramses, the Alexanders, the Caesars, the Napoleons, and on and on. But there is a man on the horizon whose rise will be as the sun's rays across the earth. He shall be the embodiment of such power and personage that the world has never seen. And the entire world will seek after him as they have no other leader ever before. He will be one who seems to stop all the fear of atomic bomb threats. He will take charge and stop all the simmering hatreds of volatile ethnic conflicts around the planet. He will stop the global fear of terrorism. He will end the fear of biological warfare. He will seemingly stop food shortages. He will also seem to triumph in the global form of religion that at last all the world can agree to one religion. It may even be that he introduces a version of Christianity which takes over the planet. The Antichrist takes the place of Christ. Our Lord Jesus warned that a day of deception is coming that was so intoxicating even God's children would succumb without his intervention. And Revelation 13 shows the second flood which will destroy our world. 
The first flood was in Genesis, and it was with water, and it was from God, and it was to judge sinful humanity. The second flood is with deception, and it's from Satan, and it's to seal the doom of humans who are unwilling to follow the Lord. Perhaps this one will step into the world from a battlefield, maybe from the polished halls of the United Nations, or even more likely, perhaps he will step to the planet Earth from a glowing metallic extraterrestrial object that will slowly descend in a globally watched spot and before the wondering eyes of all the inhabitants of the earth will step the ultimate superman the first beast as we read about his entrance in revelation 13 and i pray that the wonders of this chapter will cause all of us to want to seek god's mark and not the mark of the beast and then i stood on the sand of the sea And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. And I saw one of the heads as it had been mortally wounded, And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon, who gave the authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. And he exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is six, six, six. Let's bow together. O oh Lord, as we read these words, they're so vile to think of someone who will blaspheme your name, your dwelling place, that will blaspheme the very God of heaven, And that will be allowed to parade and march up and down this planet for 42 months, imitating your three and a half year ministry, Lord Jesus, imitating your resurrection from the dead, Lord Jesus, imitating your power from heaven, Lord Jesus. We love you. And our hearts are grieved to think that mankind and humanity would stoop to the depths to be led by this monster from the pit. 
Oh, we want to magnify your name. For the world is coming to a day when your name shall not be magnified, when it will be sought to obliterate the name of the true and living God, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Judge, from the very consciousness of this planet. Oh, we pray that you might be praised in us, and that we might be those who turn many to righteousness, that we might shine like the stars forever. May we have your compassion, Lord Jesus, wanting to go to the next town, to the next town, to the next town. May we have the, the earnestness of the Apostle Paul who said that, that he sought to tell everyone and that he earnestly pled with them that they might be reconciled to God, knowing the terror of the Lord. He persuaded all whom he met. I pray that we would get an insatiable desire to win souls to you, Lord Jesus, to tell people that before them lays a choice, a destiny, and a destination that is either blessed or horrible, and that they must choose life, that they must look at the Savior. We pray in your precious name. Amen. We're looking at the 13th chapter, and as we look at the 13th chapter, we see there are five very horrible lives that the beast foists upon the earth. I'd like to just let you outline those, and they really help us to understand. Satan has five lies that he purports through this false leader. The first one is uh, in these first two verses, and actually it starts in verse 17. Uh, but in, in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 13, there's a counterfeit authority that the beast has. You see the very last word of verse 2, and great authority. And what the Word of God tells us that we need to seek is we need to be keeping ourselves under the authority of God and escape Satan's counterfeit authority. And Satan's counterfeit authority is actually, actually rebellion against God. It started in the Garden of Eden when Eve questioned God, when she questioned, as we studied a few weeks ago, the goodness of God, when she questioned the authority of God. And I share with you that there's growing, growing evidence of this this false resurrection, this life after life kind of thing, this Betty Eady embraced by the light thing, where people think that, that they are going to this place of flowers and light. And, and uh, we see here in verse 3 through 5 that the beast has this deadly wound. In fact, probably it's an assassination attempt, uh, not attempt, but an assassination that takes place. And he is so utterly wounded that everybody knows he's dead. And then he is brought back to life. And it's a resuscitation of some kind that Satan is allowed to do because this is allowed by God. And it says at verse 3 that all the world marveled and followed him. You see, in every point, this one coming is mirroring Jesus Christ. As I said before, he's allowed to work three and a half years. How long was Christ's ministry? Three and a half years. He's allowed to have a resurrection from the dead. What is the capstone of Christ's ministry? The resurrection from the dead. He is the embodiment of all the Old Testament prophets like Elijah putting down fire from heaven. And what did Jesus do? He was the, the greatest, the chiefest. He was the great prophet that was to come. In every way, this beast is a mirror image, although an exact counterfeit image of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, it says, that starting in verse 6, that he uh, starts this deadly rampage on the earth that causes there to be this counterfeit citizenship. It says that those who must follow him must take his number, and you see the, the number shows up here at the end, but it says all who dwell on the earth, verse 8, have to worship him. And he calls people to a counterfeit citizenship. He calls them to be citizens of the earth rather than, as God says, we should be citizens of heaven. Then, starting in verse 11, this other beast coming up out of the earth, uh, very interesting terminology, coming up out of the earth. It's the same term used for when Saul conjured up Samuel through the witch at Endor. It says that he came up out of the earth. He came up from the abode of the dead. I'm not sure how much God will allow here, but this false prophet is an amazing creature, the second beast. And he leads false worship, as we see in those verses. And he causes the earth, verse 12, and all who dwell in it to worship the first beast. And he performs great signs, verse 13. And I know that it's hard, hard for us to comprehend right now, but we have become such a globally linked together society that when there's a tidal wave in, in uh, New Guinea somewhere, everybody knows about it as it's happening. 
Uh, it just breaks. And I mean, the, the news is continuously updated on the Internet. And the way things are going, the Internet's going to be tied into the television, the telephone. Everything's going to be linked together. So there's going to be almost instantaneous global communication. And so as events happen, it will touch the whole world. And this, this resurrection, uh, false resurrection, will just cause everyone in the world to be in wonder because basically in the back of everybody's consciousness is the, is the, the story of Christ. God says in John 1 that he's the light which has lighted everyone that's coming into the world. And so there's kind of an, a basic awareness of, of, of the true living God. And so when they see this, most of the world without loving the truth, they will start falling for it because they've never had the word of God. And then finally, there's this false security. If you have the mark, and that's down from verses 16 to 18, then you're secure. Well, would it surprise you to know that Americans are actually looking for someone to come down from the skies? In fact, 72% of Americans believe there's life out there beyond our solar system. Uh, of those, 48% believe that UFOs are real, and 15% of all Americans claim that they have actually seen one. And listen, this is the most astounding number. 3% of America say that they've been on a UFO and been abducted. Now, that means there are 8.4 million people who have taken an unusual ride. Uh, one noted journalist, after studying UFOs, he's not a believer, he wrote this at the end of his, and I thought it was very interesting. Uh, he said, the earth is not inhabited by these things. It's infested by them. And that would concur with what I believe. There's an unregenerate voice concurring with someone who knows the Lord. And I believe UFOs are demonic. And uh, UFOs would support the naturalistic evolutionary theory. When, when people believe in UFOs as extraterrestrial intelligence, it would mean that evolution has gone on for uh, 10 to 15 to who knows how many billions of years. And somewhere out there, life has ascended higher than here. And that's, that's why they love uh, all the space stuff. E.T.'s lesson, the incarnation of Jesus. If there are many aliens out there and they're all powerful, so what if Jesus came? And therefore, it's possible to be perfect, to overcome death and disease, and etc., because all these extraterrestrial beings, whatever they are, that, that can evade and fly around and do everything that they do, are superior to us. And so they obviously have found the answer. So that relegates the earth to just an insignificant dot in the universe, and man is not the crown of God's creation, and sin is just our problem. In fact, it's not even a problem. It's just we need to be higher in our consciousness. And hope lies in contact with one of these higher life forms, and Christ's death then was a local, not a cosmic event, and the word of God that you hold is uh, a little bit out of time and place. It's provincial. It's uh, an anachronism, and it's out of touch with the big picture of the cosmos, and we're not in God's image. See, that's what... Evolution, science fiction, UFOlogy teaches. Well, the world is headed toward unprecedented days of deception. Turn with me back to Matthew 24. Jesus commented on this, and I always love to read what he has to say as we're going through the revelation. I know every word of God is the word of Jesus, but his gospel messages concur with his inspiration through the apostles and if you look in with me at Matthew 24 24 this is what Jesus had to say about the days that that we're right now talking about the days we're going into uh, because I really believe that we're in the last day and and there are many reasons I'll share this as the series goes on but uh, among them are this that there has never been global commerce before there has never been global communication before there has never been global uh, possibility of rule before there has never been a nation Israel in the land to have a temple built period and there's never been uh, the, the the trigger hair tension that exists today of there being an atomic war in the, the Middle East in the area around Israel so if it's possible to be in the last days of the last days it's now and if it's going to hang on for and I've heard 10,000 years someone said they said the Lord could come back in 10,000 years if so, people are going to have to be very patient that, that are the bad guys in this world because their fingers are on the triggers uh, right now. But the world is headed toward an unprecedented day of deception. And this is what Jesus says. Look at verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Now, you notice that those are plural. Jesus is not specifically speaking of the Antichrist here, but he's speaking of the whole period surrounding it. The Antichrist is in verse 15, but he's talking about the whole period, and he's saying that there are going to be false Christs 
and false prophets, and they are going to do such signs and such wonders that it's going to be so deceptive that if it's possible, even the elect will be fooled. And if you back up, look at verse 11. He says, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And back up to verse 5 of chapter 24. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will deceive many. And then look at verse 4. I mean, he says it four times in this chapter. Take heed that no one, what? Deceives you. The end times are a time of primary religious deception. Right now, I don't know if you know it, but there are untold millions of people who are following after apparitions that are going on in the name of Christ all over the world. There are some in Yugoslavia, the Virgin Mary appearing, giving prophecies. Do you know what she's saying? She's saying world peace, world peace, one world religion. That's what the apparition in Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia is. Down in South America, the Virgin Mary is showing up. And people down in Mexico, she's showing up. And she's telling people, she always does the same thing. They say she has her hand up and she talks about world peace and follow one true religion. This is exactly what Jesus promised. And doesn't it, I, I'm not slamming the Virgin Mary. I'm just saying that there's going to be global religious deception. And what it's going to be is it's going to be purporting to be Christianity, purporting to be in the name of Christ. And Jesus said, verse 4, don't let anyone deceive you. Verse 5, there are many deceivers coming. Verse 11, there's going to be so much deception. Verse 24, it's going to be so deceptive that even the Christians would be deceived if God didn't hold them back. Now look at Luke 21, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Just go to the right two books, Luke, the Gospel, Luke 21. Jesus says basically the same thing. Every time Jesus talks about the future, the word deception came out. That's where we're headed. And, and I think that, that we uh, are getting a little bit lax in, in this latter 19th or, or latter 20th, nearly 21st century Christianity, in that our basic Bible knowledge is almost at the lowest level. If you look at what children had to learn in Sunday school 100 years ago and what we learn today, it's astoundingly less. It's almost proportionate to what school has done in dumbing down our population. It used to be that every child was catechized and they knew all the commandments. They knew all of the, you know, they just went through the doctrines and they knew them just like this. Nowadays, you'd be hard-pressed, other than in a, a Bible quiz time, to get someone to flawlessly quote the Ten Commandments, to know the Beatitudes, to know the key portions of the Scripture. It's just our, our, our Bible knowledge is abysmal. And now if we go past children, we go to adults. We're coming almost to illiteracy, spiritually speaking. I'm talking about not so much here, but across the nation. Look at 2111. This is what Jesus said. And there will be great earthquakes in unusual places, is what it means by various. And there will be famines and pestilences, that's outbreaks of plagues. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Hmm. Amazing. This is going to all lead toward these false teachers being listened to. And he said, they will come, these false teachers. Now look what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians. That's toward Revelation. So keep going past the Gospels and all the epistles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I think we find the key here for what the Lord wants us to learn through all this dismal prophecy of the future. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. And the whole, by the way, the whole second chapter, 2 Thessalonians 2, is all about the great apostasy. It's all about the coming of the Antichrist. And uh, it's all about God's plan for the end. But look at verses 9 and 10. The coming of the lawless one, now that's the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan. We already saw that in Revelation 13. He's empowered by the dragon, Satan. And this is what he's going to have with all power. And, and that with all is applicable to all the, the following words. It modifies all of them. With all signs, with all lying wonders, and repeat it again, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. And why are the perishing ones deceived? Look at this. Here's the key. And this is really the, the, what is our emphasis. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, verse 11, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie 
that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, I, I don't know if you caught it there, but this is two very powerful statements of what Christians are. Christians are, number one, those who receive a love for the truth. And when you love the truth, it says in, in verse 12, you have no pleasure in unrighteousness. Sin, for me, is present, but it's not pleasurable. Do you remember what it says about Moses? He esteemed lightly the treasures of Egypt and did not pursue the pleasures of Egypt. Yes, he was a sinner. We all are sinners. But sin no longer pleases us. It grieves us. That's one of the evidences of salvation. Does sin grieve your heart? Is the Holy Spirit quenched inside of you? Have you received an insatiable desire for the truth? We have so many Christians that are too busy serving, and they're not at all busy worshiping God. The kind of service that God loves is worship that, or service that issues from worship. And worship produces a right concept of God. It produces a right theology of the person of God. And it produces true service for God. And what we see here is that these lost ones, verse 9 are following the lawless one. They're following his power, his signs, his lying wonders. Verse 10, his unrighteous deception because they did not receive the love of the truth. Here's the point. We must love the truth. And the way we love the truth is loving the one who is the embodiment of the truth. We must love the one who is the truth. Satan is evil. He's the adversary, the accuser, the tempter. He looks like a dragon and a serpent. His characteristics of his life are he's a liar, a murderer, and a worthless ruler. His activities are he accuses and tempts. But God says we're not to, to have anything to do with him. We are to love the truth. Let me just read to you what the scriptures tell us about the one we are to love. The beauty of the self-existing, endlessly perfect God. He is our God, the God who is incomprehensible, the God who is holy in his triunity. He is self-existent in his eternity. He is self-sufficient in his plenitude. He is eternal in his magnitude. He is endless in his infinitude. He is immutable in his divine omniscience. He is fathomless in his wisdom. He is lovely in his holiness, and he is sovereignly our God. But the real beauty are in his names. And as I shared with you earlier, that you and I should be in a lifelong pursuit of, of finding and worshiping the names of our God. Because the names of God reveal His real beauty. He has revealed Himself in an intimate, personal, and utterly, irresistibly beautiful portrait. And He wants us to adore Him. In fact, the primary way we know God, we can know something about Him by what He does. And we can know something about Him by what He has done. But we can most of all learn about our infinite God by the revelation of His intimate personal names. Let me just read to you some of them. He is God the Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth. And if he possesses all things and, and he's our father and we're going to inherit all things, why do we spend so much of our time trying to get stuff we can't keep instead of seeking things we can't lose? It's an interesting thought. He's the almighty God, the all-seeing God, and it's not just a child that will furrow the brow to realize that he is the all-seeing God of Genesis 16. He is the judge of all the earth, Genesis 18, who will always do right, it says in verse 25. He is everlasting. Everything else is not everlasting unless it's attached to him. He is the all-providing God, Genesis 22 says. He is the God of heaven and of earth. He is the all-healing God who is merciful and faithful. He is holy. He is the God of peace who completes our life. And he's gracious. And that's compared to the liar, the murderer, the accuser, the serpent, the dragon. You know what we're to be doing? We're to be adoring our God. Let's uh, walk back through this chapter and let me show you how amazing this Superman is going to be that comes. This Superman that is coming comes, first of all, out of the place of darkness, not out of the place of light. If you look at Revelation 11, 7, we'll actually start there. Because in every way, this one is counter to our Lord Jesus Christ. And it says in Revelation 11:7, when they finish their testimony, those are the two prophets, uh, Elijah and, and probably Moses, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them. Now, this is the Antichrist. Remember, 
chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15 are all asides. And all of them span the whole period. Actually, 6, 7, and 8, and 16 are chronologically, basically. And, and uh, 9 is, is tied in with 16. But 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 are all just looking at the whole picture and fitting in kind of like the colored pictures going into the text. And what we see right here in chapter 11 is that this man, that the Superman that's going to come and take over the world, this one... Look what it says in verse 7, ascends from the place of darkness, not light. He comes in the name of Satan, energized by Satan. He is exactly opposite to, now keep your finger here and look back at John chapter 6. I want to show you the contrast. The beast comes from the pit. He comes from the darkness. He comes from Satan. But look what Jesus said in John 6 and verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will but the will of him who sent me. And verse 39, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me, of all that he has given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up in the last day. Jesus comes from above. He comes from the Father of lights. He comes from him from whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. The beast comes from the pit. He comes from the darkness. He comes from the energy of Satan, and he comes as the super, the man that the world has always been waiting for, the man with all the answers. So first of all, he comes from a place of darkness. Secondly, look at Revelation 13, 2. And if you want to uh, just stay there, I won't lose you anymore because I'm going to be reading verses from all over the Bible. But look at Revelation 13, 2. Secondly, he comes as a terrible beast with awesome power. It says in uh, verse 2 that he is a beast like a leopard. His feet are like the feet of a bear. And you know how bears can just slap and, and tear open even cars when they're looking for food. He has a mouth like the mouth of a lion, the sharpness and the deadliness. And the dragon, the dragon himself gives him power and throne and great authority. That's what this guy looks like. What did Jesus look like? Let me read to you what we've read several times in chapter 5 of Revelation, verse 6. It says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne there was a lamb as though it had been slain. Jesus comes in humility and power. I mean, humility and apparent weakness. He comes like a, a slain lamb. And this monster comes up, and he comes as a terrible beast in total opposition to the lamb who is slain. He also is given all of his power from Satan, which is opposite to Jesus, who is empowered by God, as we saw in John chapter 6. He is, look at verse 5 of chapter 13, he is a loud and powerful evil orator who can move the masses by rhetoric. He has a mouth that speaks blasphemies. That is a total contrast to Jesus Christ. You know, it says in, in the Gospel of John chapter 7, verse 46, it says, no one ever spoke like Jesus. He didn't raise his voice in the streets. He wasn't screaming. He wasn't shouting. He wasn't, he wasn't moving people by mesmerizing rhetoric. He just spoke. And like the hymn writer says, he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing. That's what Jesus is like. So unlike this beast with the big voice. Also, it says in where we read in 2 Thessalonians that the beast is the fullness of sin and evil. But Jesus, it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin. What a contrast. There are many things. His false authority in verses 1 and 2 are totally imitating the kingdom of God. He comes as the false king of kings and lord of lords. His false resurrection in verses 3 through 5 is imitating the prince of life, the firstborn from the dead. He's imitating the empty tomb. He's imitating the way, the truth, the life, and the only hope. His false citizenship that starts in verse 6 down through verse 10 is imitating the wonders of Jesus who promised us his father's house he is preparing. It's imitating the heavenly city. It's turning the streets of gold to be here on earth. It's taking the water of life from the throne of God and saying it's here on earth. It's telling those people that they are not to wait for the Son of God from heaven, but he has arrived, his false citizenship. The earthly worship of the Antichrist that's prompted starting in verse 11 when the second beast, the false prophet, just affirms his false message, is imitating the true worship of the living and true God, which is to be in spirit and in truth, not self-styled but biblical. And his false security, which starts in verse 16, as I noted before, this mark is imitating the sealing of the Holy Spirit 
by which those in the book of life are betrothed to Christ. They are his very bride. They are kept. They are protected by the power of God and kept unto salvation. So what, what is the answer to the counterfeit? What's the an- answer to this man of sin who has a false authority and a false government? Well, it's to submit ourselves to the true government of the kingdom of God. What is the answer to the false resurrection? It's to look at the empty tomb. What is the answer to the false citizenship? It's to make sure that we are enrolled in heaven. Now, you should look at this one. Look at Hebrews 12, 23. That's just back a few books. Hebrews 12, 23. It's one of those comforting verses, and maybe you haven't looked at it for a while. It says in Hebrews 12, and it goes Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. It's not very far in pages, uh, just 20 pages back. It says, let's start in verse 22 of Hebrews 12. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Now look at this. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Are you registered in heaven? Do you know your name's written down? I wonder how many of us do what the scriptures say and make sure that our, our salvation, it, it, it says in 2 Corinthians 13.5, it says, make sure, study, examine yourselves, whether you're in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, we are to examine whether we are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? I think the 13th chapter of Revelation is a call for us to check out for sure that we are in the faith. When this superman that has super intelligence, as Daniel 7, 8 says, he has an incredible intelligence, the Antichrist will. When this man who is a super communicator, Daniel 7 also tells us, his mouth speaks as no one spoke before him other than Jesus. He's a super politician. It says in Revelation 6, 2, he conquers the whole world almost without shedding any blood. He's a super businessman. It says in Daniel 8, 25, through him all the world will prosper temporarily. He's going to cause this economic euphoria we're experiencing right now to even get bigger. He's going to be a super general. Daniel 7.23 says he's going to muster all the earth into his army. And he has the super ego. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2, he speaks and exalts himself above everything that is called God. This one who comes, who's an exact counterfeit of the image of God, who has a second person of his infernal trinity, just like God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. He is from the dragon, the father. He is the son, the beast, the antichrist, and he has the false prophet, the anti-spirit. He imitates by the power of Satan a false resurrection and encounters the glorious work of Christ. He receives the worship Jesus should have received. He ministers for a very similar period to what Christ did when he was here on earth. And he becomes the head of his church, the filthy harlot, the prostitute we're going to see in chapter 17. What an exact counterfeit. I want to introduce these last few minutes by reading these to you. How do we escape the mark of the beast? How do we know the genuineness of Christ? There are three keys. Number one, we should look at our address label. Now, you know, I I was just at at a, a local business lately, and I was looking in their box by the door, and they had all these myriads of packages going out. You know, wouldn't it be a tragedy if they put the wrong label on the wrong package? And they sent off some expensive work, some expensive artwork or some expensive uh, legal documents or whatever, and they put the wrong label on. And you know that secretary that puts that label on, especially if it's something that's critical to the company, you know, she looks long and hard at that before she packages it up for FedEx, and she checks it and checks it and checks it to make sure she's not sending the document to the wrong place. Have you examined lately your, your label? Are you a citizen of heaven or an earth dweller? Do you know where you're headed? Secondly, have you turned on your security system? Have you made sure that you are an authentic, signed, genuine piece of God's handiwork? Are you sealed as a secure container of heavenly treasure? In fact, the way you know that is the more weakened your body gets and the older and the more the ravages of time break down our strength, what comes out? That's why the apostle said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that we have this treasure in an earthen vessel so that the excellency of the power might be of God. The more that we're weak, the more that that we are short in our time on earth, the more that our earthly bodies are decaying and we are closer and closer to heaven, the more the treasure of 
of Christ spills out of our lives. How we should allow our weakness to show the righteousness of Christ coming out of us. And next time you're sick, you can't blame it on being sick, that you're irritable and mean and angry. It's because we're not letting the treasure of Christ come out. Thirdly, we should investigate the real thing. How well do you know Jesus by personal contact? How quickly do you recognize him in his book? Have you begun a lifelong pursuit of Jesus Christ in this book, the genuineness of Christ? I want to close our study of Revelation 13 by turning to 2 Corinthians 1. Okay, 2 Corinthians 1, because he marks everybody with a false mark. I want to show you the real mark, okay? And that's what we're going to celebrate. Because we are secure because God's Spirit has sealed us. And we read this whole chapter. We see he's going to have this mark. You can't buy or sell. It's going to be on the head or on the, on the hand. You know what? It doesn't matter just what it is. There's two things we know for sure. Everyone is going to know what it means, and no true believer is going to take it. And the way we know for sure no true believer is going to take it is because we, it says in 2 Corinthians 1, are sealed. So instead of looking and spending all of our time speculating about whether it's going to be, and I've got all the files and I, I know it's important, but whether or not it's going to have something to do with a barcode and whether it's going to be under the skin or on top of the skin or whether it's going to be a transponder or whether they're going to put it in your bloodstream, it's going to go all around. You know what? It really doesn't matter. It's going to happen. And the whole world's going to get it. I thought it was really interesting that that they now can put chips in pets so you never lose your animal. Isn't that interesting? And through the GPS system, they can track your pet when it runs away and tell you it's at your neighbor's house, you know, through a special system. And if we can do that with animals, you can bet the beast will do that with people. So we don't need to worry about that. He's working on that. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. How do we resist the mark of the beast? How do we know the genuineness of Christ? It says this, 2 Corinthians 1, 22. A wonderful, wonderful promise who also has sealed us. We are secure because God's Spirit seals us. And the ancient world was built around the security of sealed shipments. With all the perils of the old world, it was imperative that when a customer ordered something, he knew his shipment would come untainted from the journey. Thus, all the ancients recognized the sealing of goods. And this was accomplished by the pressing of a signet ring into soft wax across the opening of the document or the tomb or the sealed box of goods. So the Holy Spirit seals us, certifying us as our contents are secure. What is that image? It's the image of Christ that we bear. What's the soft clay? It's our will yielding to him. God's Spirit verifies that the image of Christ is on us. Look at the second part. Not only does, are we secure because God's Spirit seals us, but we're secure because God's Spirit secures us. It says in the second part of verse 22, and has given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit is given to us as a pledge. God delivers us an engagement ring. What does that mean? Well, it says in John 1:12, but as many as received him... God's gift to us is gracious. It's a gift he gives us. God's supply is inexhaustible. It says in John 3, 34, He whom God sent speaks the word of God, for God doesn't give his spirit by measure. God doesn't just pour out a little bit. When we're saved, we get all of the Holy Spirit. We get all of him. Inexhaustible. God's anointing is personal. It says in 1 John 1, 20, You have an anointing from the Holy Spirit. You know all things. What does that mean? That we're signed by the Holy Spirit and sealed? Just some verses to write down. Number one, Christ's intimacy is what our sealing promises us. Listen to this. Jesus was praying, John 17, 24, and he says this, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Did you know Jesus prayed that for us? In fact, we just celebrated the Lord's table right in the spot where he prayed that in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I told all, the, all of the Holy Land pilgrims as we were there on our knees and some of them right down on their faces on the ground. I says, you're on the spot where Jesus prayed for you. And what did he pray? He prayed, I want you to be with me. I want you to be with me. Romans 8, 17, we're adopted. If heirs were joint heirs of God, we have been adopted. What does that mean Christ is going to do? It means that someday he's going to put his robe on us. And I want to read to you what it's going to be like when we go home. What it's going to be like. What, what our loved ones that have recently gone or long ago went into the presence of the Lord. What they experienced because they had the mark of God, the seal of the Spirit on them. 
What an unbelievable promise Jesus gives us. Jesus, with his nail-scarred hands outstretched, will welcome us through the door of death. Jesus, who walked with us through the dark valley, will welcome us, citizens of heaven, to glory. Not as the fluttering host that slips away. No, he walks by us down the golden streets. He will lead us up the broad main street of the river of the water of life. He will lead us all around the saints of all the ages as they look on in wonder. As again, Jesus leads one of his precious blood-bought brothers and sisters up to meet their father in heaven. And then on the throne in blazing light, with the river of fire flowing from before him, with billions of angels standing around him, the Ancient of Days will look on his beloved son walking toward him. And there, as we hold the hand of Jesus, we hear him call us by our new name, the one he gave us, our name. And standing there before the throne... God will hear Jesus present us by name as his beloved and precious one. That's what it means to know the genuineness of Jesus. It occurs as we respond to either believe or disbelieve his his word. As we realize our destiny is either obedience and following him or disobedience and following the Antichrist. The final issue is the critical area. We have to choose to receive the free gift of Christ or reject it. We have to choose to take the nail-pierced hand or turn away. We have to choose to bow and give up everything for him or miserably fail in our vain attempt to rescue ourselves. There's no hope of heaven except in the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. What a joy to know who we believe in and to worship him.